From the California State Senate, this is Senate Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this segment of Senate Spotlight, where we discuss legislative priorities, policy, and other related issues with members of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and joining us this time around is State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, representing the 19th Senate District, the beautiful South Coast, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. She is also chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and also chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus. Welcome. Glad Thank to have you, you here. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Delighted it's chance to talk with you and share some ideas with those people who are viewing us. Uh, we have a lot today. to talk about, and I hope we can fit it all in in our time. How, how have the first couple of months been? You're two months in as we speak into the legislative session. Right. How, how's it going? Well, it's, it's a very exciting year. California is really roaring back, and so now is our opportunity to make sure that everybody has a, a fair crack at the California dream while we continue to grow the economy. It's uh, going to be very important that we make sure all families and all of our Californians are able to enjoy the benefits of this economic boom uh, and that our families, uh, women and children particularly speaking, are very much a part of the, uh, the movement towards uh, a more kind of robust uh, economic and quality of life experience here. Well, that is a perfect segue for what we want to talk about here. Throughout your career as a lawmaker and even in the private sector, your priorities have been uh, equality and equity, uh, rights of the individual, rights of groups, rights of populations, socially and economically, and as you say, as the economy continues to improve and people return to the workforce, really making sure no one's left behind, right? Correct. And, you know, it's been a real challenge because while we've co we're coming out of the recession, there are a lot of people who haven't been able to come out of it uh, with us. And so one of the things that's been important to me, both uh, in terms of my legislative priorities uh, and as chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus, is to figure out why not and what we can do to bring those people uh, with us. Uh, looking at your recent legislation, actually taking you back to 2014, uh, one of your bills from last year that was signed by the governor, your goal was to ensure equity and recovery and rights in the workplace. And then the other, which was already signed, which I believe became law mid-year last year, was to strengthen Paid Family Leave Act here in California. Let, let's talk about SB 1028. That's sure, the first one sure. dealing with uh, getting the long-term unemployed uh, trained and back in the workforce. And you're, you're going to the Cal Grant process for right. that. Right. You know, what we discovered is that people who were long-term unemployed were far less likely to actually get back back into the workforce. So what we did is uh, we have these Cal grants that we give, uh, and they're designed to help people, to give them some funding, to give them some resources as they get back into the workforce. We identified those people who have been unemployed for six months or more, who have to uh, send out three and a half times as many resumes just to get a job interview, because that, the, the, the signal that goes to employers is, oh, there, there must be something wrong with these folks. So what we've done is we identified that Cal Grant C should be available to these folks so that they have an opportunity to go back and retrain. Uh, a couple of the conditions are that they go back and retrain for jobs that happen to be available within their community. So they're not just going back and, and wasting their time and uh, losing hope that there will be a job for them. If they can identify areas within their own communities where there is a need for that kind of job, they go back, they get that training, they're going to be more likely to get that employment. And that's going to be very helpful for the local area and for those individuals to get back to work. The recovery here in California, it's, it's getting better, but it's lasted a long time. And looking at when the governor introduced his state budget in January, uh, the governor was given some pushback in the debate over this growing economic divide. Uh, and poverty in California, people that are still out of work oh, and still absolutely. falling through the safety net, and this dramatic need for social services and the decision really to not really increase funding for those services moving along. And the governor did get some pushback, and, and there was this, you could almost see this, uh, we've, I've had this discussion with some of your colleagues here, this, this, uh, the Jesuit in him saying, you know, uh, the, the poor, you know, we need to help these folks, the pragmatic governor saying the poor is always with us and we're just gonna do the best we can. Well, what, I where think, do you fall Yeah, I think if you look at it as investment, Investing in our people. Uh, then what we really need to do is uh, one area that the Women's Caucus has been very involved in is the whole issue of child care. You know, a lot of women, 1.7 million households in California are um, run by women. And so it's really important that those women have access to quality, affordable uh, 
uh, child care for their children. Uh, yet of that 1.7 million women run ho households, uh, about 428,000 of them, about 28%, live below the poverty level. So that's one area where we need to, to make available to these people access to child care. We've lost over, we lost over 100,000 of those uh, child care slots during the recession. We're trying to build those up. Another area where we, we need to kind of identify and address the problem is on paid family leave. Mm -hmm. This is an area where you, primarily women, are the caregivers, particularly when they have grandparents or grandchildren uh, uh, or loved ones, siblings and all, who are sick. And they have to choose, unfortunately, or have had to choose between whether or not they care for these people who are usually quite ill or whether they put food on the table. So I did a bill that expands the definition of family. And became uh, law this last and year. And it became law this year, which now allows you to be able to take up to six weeks of paid family leave to care for a sick grandparent or a sick grandchild or a sibling or in-laws, something we didn't have before, and still be able to take 55% of your salary because actually you've already paid into a system as an insurance policy effectively so that you're able to do that. We expanded that law. We're going to see more and more people hopefully uh, being able to care for their loved ones without having to uh, remove the food from the tables of their family. It's been a decade and change since California became the first state in the nation to provide partial payment for family right. leave. We've had a lot of successes here. California's looked to uh, as the the laboratory for that. But there seems to be here, um, looking at 2015, kind of this image problem, this PR problem, this outreach problem. A lot of people don't know it exists, that there's sure. still the fight to get employers to provide it and even for employees to ask for it. Uh, I, I know you're looking at that as well. How is that issue being addressed? Well, we did get some money in the in the budget this year so that we could just give people that information. In, when they're in the workplace, they will know that that uh, opportunity is available to them. A lot of what we've done in California California. Uh, sadly, people are not completely aware of, and education and information is a critical component. The same way uh, as we look at some of the social challenges that we have, educating and informing the public so that they know what is expected of them, what is acceptable behavior. These are things that we need to, uh, we need to have this dialogue going forward as well. And I know you are also working on the issue, the concern, the loophole about the struggle of people being retaliated against. They get demoted or they get right. fired. Uh, you're trying to close that loophole too, right? Well, that that is true. We're trying to do that uh, not only in uh, the area of family leave. In fact, that they're, they are that money is money that you and I put in every month in our paycheck. We put a little money away, so the employer isn't having to pay any of that. That's I think a very critical component too. But one of the things that we're looking at uh, in terms of the whole issue of knowledge about what goes on in the workplace is this issue of equal pay for equal work. And uh, one of the components of that is that frequently people don't know what their colleagues are making, so mm -hmm. they don't know what whether or not they're being paid fairly or not, and they're afraid to say anything for fear that they will be retaliated against. I'm doing a bill this year, the Fair Pay Act of 2015, which will provide not only the opportunity to know what your colleagues are making, but the, the, the guarantee that you won't be retaliated against. And of course, we're also trying to define mm -hmm. what equal pay for equal work is. And uh, that's a subject that's been near and dear to my heart for well over 30 years. It's one that we, uh, we need to address because, the, as I mentioned, we see more and more women as heads of household. We see more and more dollars left uh, essentially off the table because women are frequently not paid for work that we pay men a higher wage to do. There's a gender uh, gap in that situation, and we've got to address that, and we've got to fix it. And obviously, this was an issue not only here in this state, this country, and with the legislature, even before Patricia Arquette got up at the That's Oscars uh, a couple of weeks ago and sort of touched that third rail of uh, gender equity, the equal pay. Uh, it's something you've been working on for a long time. Well, and the fact is that she sort of lit the match. This is something, as I mentioned, that's been an issue. Do we do we pay people the same for comparable worth, or do we pay them the same for the same work? And the fact is that what's happened is that because of gender, women are frequently paid less for the same work. 
And is it true, if some of the stats say that a lot of times women are uh, still seeking or, or only getting lower wage jobs and also uh, be having still only to work part time because they're doing childcare? So you know, it's a complicated issue. It is. But yeah. if we're going to lift all boats, if we're going to have a, uh, an economic boom that all Californians can enjoy, we have to address these issues. It's no longer the case where women work for pin money, uh, as my grandma did. Uh, what they work for today is to put food on the table. Table. And uh, we have we see so many two-parent families at work. We see so many women as the primary breadwinner, and so many women or men as the sole support of their children. And we've got to make sure that they're paid appropriately, so that we can lift all boats uh, as as our economy continues to grow. Hey, as we talk about this, here, here's this Oprah question, this loaded question here for you: Why in 2015 is this still an issue? Why is there still so much of an element of if only in this this rallying cry? I mean, goodness sakes, the World Wrestling Entertainment Organization is on board with this. Meryl Streep applauded. Jennifer, you know, even in the motion picture industry, this is still, a, I mean, obviously, it would take forever to fully answer this question, but why are we, why is this still an issue in that regard? Well, it's, it's, it's a complicated one. For, for far too long, women have undervalued their own work uh, and their own value. And uh, what we need to do is, as we uh, talk with our young women in particular and our young girls and boys, we say to them, look, you judge a person on the basis of what they ha are able to do, what they can do, their education, their experience, the stress associated with the job, uh, the success in that job, and you turn blinders to gender because uh, we are seeing that there continues to be a serious discrimination uh, based on gender. And there are other social reasons, too. Uh, women is the primary caregiver. Uh, I mentioned child care. That's a problem. We don't have enough child care. We don't have enough quality child care. Mm -hmm. uh, if women are forced to leave the workforce, then they lose some very valuable years in the workforce. If they, if they choose to leave voluntarily, that's one thing. But if they have to leave for economic reasons, then we as a society have got to address those issues. Right, and I think it, your your point is well taken here, and it goes even beyond the, the pay equity issue. It's You had a resolution last year urging more women to be given a seat at the table on the corporate boards and in the high-level positions. So they get at the table, they get on these corporate boards, they're still shushed. They're still, their male colleagues still cut them off and steal their ideas. Uh, well, there's still this genteel sexism that's still out there. Not so How sure it's genteel, but there is certainly a, a subtle and not so subtle sexism. Mm -hmm. Sexism. So this bill called upon California's uh, leading corporations, urging them, not demand, not requiring, but urging them to put more women on their boards of directors. Why? Well, women bring that experience to the table. Many of them will be working moms. They'll understand the needs to to pr make sure that child care is available. Hopefully, we'll see more and more businesses putting childcare on site. What they've discovered is when you have women on boards like this, you see an increase in profits. It's good for business. Uh, a lot of it is just it's hard to change old habits and bad habits, and we tend as a society to reinforce them, which is one of the things, too, with this legislation uh, and a lot of the legislation I'm doing is to challenge people, is to educate them and inform them of the levels of discrimination and to demonstrate that those aren't productive, they're not helpful to society, they're not fair, and they uh, decry what we want in this state and this country, which is equality for all people. Great. Well, just a couple of final moments here. I want to talk about one of your other bills here that you've introduced for uh, 2015, SB 142 on drones. Now, at first glance, that might not seem one that's part of Hannah Beth Jackson's palette of legislation, but it's really not dealing with these flying objects. It's dealing with the issue of privacy. Absolutely. Tell us about your bill. Well, uh, as the chair of the uh, Senate Committee on Privacy, uh, on uh, the Judiciary, privacy is one of our key issues. There are certain fundamental rights that we have that you can't monetize. You can't say, well, we're going we're gonna to get rid of it because we can make more money by doing something else. We now have tremendous innovation in California, very exciting. Drones actually uh, can serve a very, very useful purpose. Uh, they've been used to fight fires. They're used for agriculture. Uh, they're used for all sorts of innovation. But they also can be a threat to our right of privacy, which is a fundamental right here in California. So we have to balance the innovative aspects of them as well as the privacy aspects. A drone should not be 
be permitted to hover over your uh, um, home and in your backyard to see what you're doing. Uh, and in fact, that's uh, the uh, basis of this legislation. If it's trespassing to jump over your neighbor's fence and into their backyard uh, without permission, that's exactly the same thing that we should be uh, uh, charging a drone. A person who flies a drone into your backyard is committing trespass if they're there without your invitation. Is the privacy issue being looked at on the federal level as well? I know the FAA has ruled on it. It's being discussed in Washington. Are they looking at the well, privacy? Well, drones, part? again, drones serve many purposes. Part of the issue is what, how they can be used by the government, how they can be used by law enforcement. Uh, the, the focal point of my uh, effort at the moment is to address the private use of drones and it, uh, the private use for purposes that don't have any real justification other than invading one's privacy. So we'll see how it works. There will be a lot of discussion. You know, the innovation has kind of gotten ahead of us, and what we have to do is decide as a society uh, what levels of privacy we want, uh, what levels of, of uh, sort of expanding the use of this innovation we're going to allow, and, and have the discussion to make that decision accordingly. And just a final question here. It is very interesting talking about issues of privacy, talking about issues of equity and, and everyone having a seat at the table, how fragile it really all is, even as we make progress. Uh, these things are really fragile and, and new technology can come in and encroach and threaten and also attitudes can. Just a re final reflection well, on that. Well, you know, there's an old book called Brave New World and uh, in so many respects we have reached that area where technology is so far ahead of us, biological issues, uh, uh, cloning, things like this. We have to have a conversation. What we as human beings want our society to look like while we advance in innovation and technology and biomedical issues, really who we are and who we want to be as a people going forward. Great. Thank you for this time. For all okay. the interviews we have done over the years, it's nice to have you here in this format and chatting. I hope we can bring you back soon because I know it's still to be continued on all of this. My so. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson from the South Coast, Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, uh, joining us here today as she is the chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus and also the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And that is it for this edition of Senate Spotlight. We invite you to join us next time around as we discuss important legislative issues and policies with the newsmakers and newsbreakers of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Senate Spotlight.